This is the Microsoft Cloud Show, episode 127. This is a special episode with an interview with Microsoft's Dan Holm and covering the Future of SharePoint event in San Francisco, California on May the 4th, 2016. Welcome to the Microsoft Cloud Show, the only place to stay up to date on everything going on in the Microsoft Cloud world, including Windows Azure, Office 365, SharePoint, Exchange, Link, and related technologies. Just the information, no marketing, no BS. I'm Andrew Connell. And I'm Chris Johnson. And we're just two dudes telling you how we see it. The Microsoft Cloud Show is sponsored by Valid NL. Valid is a Microsoft Gold partner whose mission is to enable its customers to excel in their business through the innovative use of technology. Valid is always on the lookout for consultants, architects, and engineers. Do you know Azure, Business Intelligence and Analytics, .NET, Office 365, or SharePoint? Look them up on valid.nl. Good morning, CJ. How are you? Very well. Very well. How are you? I'm doing good. What's new in your life? Oh, man. What isn't new? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) Oh, yeah. No, lots going on at this end. Lots going on. It's nice, though. Uh, My son just turned eight, so had a bit of a family event this weekend, and uh, he's riding around on a new bike and loving life, so things are good. Oh, that's awesome. Things are good. And working hard, obviously, so... Yeah. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. I am up to my armpits in XAML right now. <laughs> <laughs> the whiteboard has definitely changed behind you since uh, last week. I can definitely see that. <laughs> oh, yeah. There you go. Yeah. Up to my armpits in XAML and uh, C Sharp and stuff like that. Like, I think I hinted at it last week or the week before and um, doing some Windows work. So, uh, yeah, no, it's fun. Awesome. How about you? Like you, I had two family birthdays, my brother and my mom. So, we did some stuff this past weekend. And I am, uh, I've been eyeballs deep, uh, eyeballs deep, eyeballs deep, and trying to like redeploy my multi-tenant orchard deployment that I use for my blog, my site, the podcast, and a couple other sites, and trying to get it in a much cleaner way. It's really cool what they've done because now you can have no settings and no configuration in the code base, but instead uh, have a couple change, a couple tweaks in the app settings. So like up in the Azure Web App. And then put uh, all the rest of the the main sensitive stuff is in Azure Blobs. And so I finally got all that working, but we have kind of a big episode coming out this week. And so I've decided not to push it all out to production. It's all running in my staging and test stuff, but I'm going to wait to... That is a smart move. I see you've done this before. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) I am the developer who is terrified of doing deployments. That's why continuous deployment, I love it because lots of little updates makes me feel so much better than one giant update. Exactly, exactly. What have we got on the show this week? Yeah, this is an interesting one because we are recording on May the 3rd, but this is going to release on May the 4th. And May the 4th is a special day because it's, it's Star, Star Wars, Wars Day. day. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not, we, don't, we don't get along. <laughs> so May the 4th uh, is, uh, as you guys, if you haven't heard the news already today and you haven't already picked up on it, May the 4th is the future of SharePoint. So Microsoft held a special event today or the day that you're, that this podcast is being released. They held a special event in San Francisco, California today that they called the Future of SharePoint. And it really is a vision event. And the idea behind it was to really kind of do a, a reset on SharePoint for everybody to understand where they're going, what their plan is, what their vision is and stuff like that. So CJ and I have some stuff that we want to talk about first, but what we did is we actually, uh, just a day or so ago, I sat down with uh, Microsoft's Dan Holm, the new Microsoft's Dan Holm, who is the director of marketing for SharePoint. And Dan and I talked about all the stuff that was disclosed today, that the day you're hearing this on May the 4th. I keep saying today, I'm gonna, that's going to be in the context of May the 4th. Sure. Sure. So Dan and I talked about a lot of stuff. We talked about the new team sites. We talked about document libraries. We talked about a lot of cool stuff that's coming down the pipe. Unfortunately, we also talked about two other things, uh, something called the SharePoint framework and then also something called Microsoft Flow and how they relate to SharePoint. But we had a bit of a technical problem and 50%, my recording went great. It recorded all 52 minutes of our interview Dan, well, his recording died on 26 minute mark, and we can now um, confidently say that it was a problem with Chrome and Windows 10 that failed on it. And so we didn't have a backup recording going. Dan was kind enough to to jump on and do the recording at seven o'clock in the morning, his time when he was slammed and getting ready for May the 4th. And sadly, we tried, but we were I was unable to reconnect with him. So what we're going to do at the after CJ and I talk for just a minute here, Dan and I are going to, or I'm going to, we're going to play the the 26 minute part of the interview that covers the new team sites, covers the gist of what happened on May the fourth, and also 
covers um, the new publishing stuff that they also released on May the 4th. But before we do that, CJ and I just want to talk about some of this stuff first and just focus on this. And then we'll get back to some more like newsy kind of stuff in the in our next episode. Yeah, absolutely. So this is kind of a big milestone for SharePoint. It's been a number of years coming. And uh, it's super important for the product, I think, because you know a few years ago when I when I was working at Microsoft, uh, everybody was pretty doom and gloom about the future of SharePoint, right? Everybody was like, "This is the last version of SharePoint on prem, and what are Microsoft doing? They don't know what they're doing, and this is ridiculous. There's never going to be another one." Because Microsoft wears blinkers when they see something shiny, and a few years ago that was Office 365 and the cloud, and so Microsoft got its blinkers on. I call them blinkers. You know those things you stick on the side of a horse to keep them looking. The right direction. And so Microsoft had their blinkers on and were looking at the cloud as like the future of everything at Microsoft. And Microsoft has to do that internally. The culture is you've got to be looking at this shiny thing like that that you need payoff in five to eight years away. Otherwise, people are in complete and utter disarray and don't know which direction to go in. And so it's just the kind of the way Microsoft works. They get these blinkers on and they've got to, you know, aim for the thing that they've got to hit in five years' time or it doesn't happen. But Everybody externally took that as Microsoft no longer cares about SharePoint on-premises and all that sort of stuff. And so everybody was all doom and gloom about there never being another version. And of course, that didn't prove to be the case at all. SharePoint 2016 is RTM'd. It RTM'd, I think, in February or some, or March or something like that. Yeah, I think and, March. Uh, Pi Day. March, March 14th. Oh, yeah, it was too. It was Pi Day. Yeah, you're right. And Which is obviously great because... You know, SharePoint on-premises is a ginormous business and continues to be and will continue to be for many, many, many years to come. And Microsoft are not completely stupid, believe it or not. And contrary to what many people will believe, there are some sane people there. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, just dropping a two and a half or three billion dollar business on its face is not a very smart move in most people's books. And so to me, this is absolutely no surprise that there's been another release of SharePoint for on-premises. But the SharePoint, uh, the future of SharePoint event is primarily about what's coming next, not what came in the RTM of SharePoint on-premises. So that's why they're holding this event to sort of paint the picture, hey, we've done this on-prem thing, and here's where we're heading over the next wee while with SharePoint. Yeah, and this, as Dan talked about in my interview with, you'll hear that there was nothing that was kind of, there's nothing you can go play with today. There's some stuff that's a little bit that you might have seen that's new. Like, for example, the document libraries have gotten a bit of a... Some of the doc lib. Yeah. They got to refresh because now they look a lot more like OneDrive, which, I mean, it makes sense. Let's have a consistent experience across Microsoft properties. But it's stuff that you're going to see. This is really much a here's what's coming. And some people may may ask, you know, why is Microsoft doing this event like in the middle of May or the beginning of May? And I guess... For, and this is not putting any words in their mouth, but I think that we would have seen all of this news at, like, say, a SharePoint conference in the past, or we would have seen it at an Ignite conference. Um, because if you think Ignite was about the same time last year, but we don't have any kind of a conference coming up uh, that, where they would do this until late this fall. So this is nice because they're able to kind of stand out on their own, do their own SharePoint thing. And it really is like a bit of a, a reset of the tone, how it's a rededication of SharePoint. A lot of the changes you're going to see here are all coming primarily just for for Office 365, and then we'll see them probably a, a subset of them, or maybe a significant subset of them, uh, making their way down to on-prem. But I would think that if you haven't seen the the stuff that was announced today, and you can go watch the video of all of, all of everything that CJ and I are talking about, if you go to AKMS, I'm sorry, AK.MS slash Future of SharePoint. They have everything that's going to be recorded. You'll be able to grab that, plus a bunch of pre-recorded videos as well for deep dives. All of that, this is all kind of like a future kind of looking forward stuff. If you're looking for on-prem stuff, stay tuned. CJ and I actually have, have an interview that we've done with Todd Clint, which I can't wait to share it with you guys because I haven't laughed that hard in a long time. <laughs> that was a good show. <laughs> but that'll be episode 128. We'll have that come out next week on our regular schedule. Uh, but... Uh, for now, let's just focus on future SharePoint. Yeah, I definitely think that you know you're right, and that this would have come out in some other venue had you know anything been different. I do think this is uh, this is going to sound a little crude, but this is this is Jeff Teeper a leg and on his patch. So this is this is marking his territory, right? It's been a while since he's come back to SharePoint. He's the corporate vice president of OneDrive and SharePoint, and he's come back, reset the vision 
set the priorities and the strategy for SharePoint. And this is the first event where we've really got to see what he's got in store for the future of SharePoint, right? And he's he, so he's come back and decided, you know, looked at all the plans, formulated a strategy, got all the teams rolling in the right direction, starting to build stuff. And now they're coming out and saying, hey, here's where I'm going to take this product. And um, so for me, this is a really, this is a real coming out party for Jeff and his, and back in his old role in as corporate vice president of uh, OneDrive and SharePoint, and um, which is his new role as well. So I think it's a great, it's coming out party for Jeff, seeing his vision and strategy where he's going to take the product. And um, I expect to see more of these, you know, more regularly. Without a SharePoint conference, I think we'll see these more uh, more regularly. Awesome. One of the things that we didn't get a chance to talk to to Dan about, or at least, sorry, I did, but nobody else did apparently, nobody get to hear it, is that we, one of the things that Dan and I talked about is, uh, again, was the uh, SharePoint team sites and uh, the main tone of it. Uh, we also talked about some of the publishing improvements, but CJ and I are going to hold off on talking about that because that was in the interview. Um, instead, let me, let's talk about something that specific to the developers out there, because there's a big bit of news here that was announced today, and that's Microsoft doing it. We definitely need to go into a much deeper dive on this in a separate episode here, because I know that a lot of our listeners are SharePoint people. I know that you're very interested in hearing about some of this stuff, or at least let us know, too. Are you interested in hearing about this stuff? CJ and I have a We've got a mailing list that you've heard, we've talked about, we've, we've set up, and we've also got a survey for our listeners. We're not going to spam you. In fact, we haven't even, I don't even think we've sent an email out on the newsletter yet. But the idea is, is to find out, to, to have more of a conversation with you and to get more, to get your input. Yeah. I'm going to take the assumption that, hey, we got some, we got devs here, right? So one of the big things that Microsoft announced is something called the SharePoint framework. Now, yes. let me just explain what this is and then we'll kind of throw in some, some two cents here. Now, CJ and I, are, we had seen early versions of this and we knew we know the gist of what is coming out with this. It is not available today. It's gonna to be coming out over the course of the summer and we'll see additional support for it coming down the road. It's gonna be primarily an Office 365 SharePoint Online thing. Uh, and we'll see about it coming to on-prem uh, in the future. But what this is, is essentially a way we, we, in the past, we've had the ability to build client-side based applications in SharePoint. You could use sandbox solutions, farm solutions, SharePoint hosted add-ins, you could do di any different thing, but they still were, were limited in certain ways and there were still things that we had to do server-side. What the SharePoint framework is, is you can think about it as a set of libraries that you can use to build client-side solutions on SharePoint and it's, it may not be the way of building every single application, but it may be the preferred way, I would think, that Microsoft would like for us to build applications. Building things like client-side web parts, we can actually take over, like, instead of how we used to be stuck inside mm. of an app web, or as people joked about them calling a ghetto web, because it was like a SharePoint site, but it was, it was handcuffed. This is giving us a way to have like a full immersive experience and taking over the entire page. There's a lot of stuff they're giving us about data access and leveraging graph and security and context and such and caching. It's a brand new way to actually build and deploy applications uh, to SharePoint. Yeah, it's really interesting for a couple of reasons to me. I've got some pros and some cons on this. First up, I vividly remember a Facebook conversation with Mark Anderson, one of the SharePoint MVPs many years ago, where... I said, what you really need is to treat the UI hooks in SharePoint as an API. And that SharePoint has never done this before, right? SharePoint has never really said, outside of web parts and a couple of menu things, they've never said, here is an API for UX that you can hook into and to do your thing. And so there have been people you know, far and wide over the last few years, over the last five, 10 years even with SharePoint, who have hacked, hammered, bashed, squished, wedged, any adjective you want, right, to try and get their apps into SharePoint or customize the SharePoint UI. And it's all been really disgusting and hokey. And because it's never been built to do it that way, right? And so people have been sort of trying to bend it to their will. Uh, and it's been fragile and painful to do. It hasn't been super robust because, you know, as we know, Microsoft introduced a change and all your UI stuff breaks. This is the first attempt, in my view, this is the first attempt that SharePoint has had at making the UI an API. And by that I mean defining a set of hooks in a very clear way that developers can take advantage of to extend the UX in SharePoint. From that perspective, I'm super excited about it because I think it'll give these guys ways of building things that are much safer than what they're doing today. The downside of it is 
I think we're going back to full trust code days with this model. Like it looks to me like it's full trust code again. It's admin deployed. It's um, all your JavaScript and all your stuff is running in the context of a site. It's not isolated in any way. So to me, I'm yet to draw a complete conclusion on this, but uh, I need to play with the model some more. But it feels like a little, a little enterprisey and not enough ISV because it's painful for customers to go and install ISV products that have uh, full trust. Now, I haven't seen it in a few months. I'm not going to say anything about it because I haven't I haven't had a chance to, to look at what, I, what the progress they've made over the last few months, nor have I seen um, yet what they released today or they announced today because, frankly, we're recording this before they actually announced it and showed their videos. That is fair. I, I do want to spend more time on this, and I do. it is a pretty big deal, and the question is going to come up, what, yet another development model? We went from farm solutions to sandbox solutions to add-ins, and now we're going over to SharePoint framework, nothing is being deprecated, nothing's being taken away. What I do think that we need, uh, what I do think that we will do, CJ and I will do, is we will reach out to Microsoft and get someone to come on the show to have a deeper uh, discussion about it because it is a pretty big piece to the development story for Office 365 and the cloud development piece. So we'll, yeah. we'll definitely find someone there. In the meantime, I would recommend that everyone first go, again, go to aka.ms future, slash future of SharePoint and go look at the videos there. Look at stuff that people like Dan Kogan, Chex, Luca Bandinelli, look at what those guys are talking about because those are the guys on the team that are actually building this stuff. I also would recommend Microsoft did hold two developer kitchens, one in the U.S. and one in uh, Europe, where people from the community and from ISVs came in by their invitation and did a lot of work with this new framework to see what they could build. And I've, I've heard really positive things from the surface from all of those people. Microsoft has asked them to uh, share their experiences. We're not going to see a lot of code or full-blown solutions and stuff because, again, this is not yet released. But I would recommend you go check out a couple different links. We'll have them in our show notes. We'll also have them in the uh, notes on the post as well in your, uh, your blog or your podcast uh, list app. Posts by the likes of Doug Ware, Mark Anderson, Waldeck Mastercars, Mikhail Svensson, Paul Schaefline, Chris O'Brien, uh, Victor Wheel, and those, that's like the who's who of a lot of the different devs that are out there. Yep. They have all committed to having posts that are out there. It should be published as of the time that you get this episode. So CJ and I have seen some stuff, but we haven't built anything with this framework yet. I would, rec- I would recommend you go look at what those guys have done because they're the ones that have actually had hands on and they don't work for Microsoft. So they're going to give you a really good perspective on it. Very true. Very true indeed. Yeah. So CJ, why don't we go ahead and just run the interview here with Dan, uh, let it go, and then we'll do a quick little wrap up towards the very end. Sounds good. Awesome. All right. Today, I have the pleasure of talking with Microsoft's own Dan Holm. Wait, that... Wait, Microsoft's own Dan Home. That's a bit of a change. Dan, how are you this morning? I'm great, Andrew. Yeah, it's still strange for me to hear that as well, especially coming from you, who I've known for so long. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So uh, I guess we should start with an introduction here, not like you need an introduction, but we mentioned that, you know, that when you switched over to Microsoft just in the last few weeks, a uh, month or so, and tell the listeners, like, who are you and, and how can they, uh, what's this at Microsoft uh, domain name that you've got behind your uh, your name now in your email? I know, it's kind of crazy. Yeah, as, as you know, I've been an MVP for about 10 years on SharePoint and uh, have been in technology for 20 years at this point, <laughs> over two decades, in fact. And just exactly a month ago today, four weeks ago, I joined Microsoft and came on board as the director of product marketing for SharePoint. So now I'm lucky enough to be working with the likes of Bill Baer and Mark Cashman and Chris McNulty and Seth Patton and to have day-to-day interactions with the incredible Jeff Teeper and, and Adam Harmitz and Jeremy Manzer and their teams. It's really surreal to be on this side of the Redmond address now and a real honor. Yeah, that's awesome, man. I, mean, I, I know you've been a great advocate for the SharePoint, the product and the community for, gosh, I don't even remember when we first met, but it's been, we don't need to go that far back, I guess. We don't just embarrass the, the both of us here, but um, yeah, it's been, I mean, I, it's a huge asset for Microsoft to pick up you to join Microsoft and help them. And I tell you, from from someone who sits on the outside, uh, definitely gives me a nice comfort to know someone that like you have the your hands at the wheel so it's nice to very nice to know like on the marketing side very very trustworthy very reliable person so it's very nice to have you uh, have you over there well i appreciate that you uh, that you feel that way andrew obviously and you know if, if a few people see that my move to microsoft is an endorsement of what i see microsoft doing that's actually true i wouldn't have taken this job years i wouldn't have taken this job two or three years ago even i think what 
what we've done as a company at Microsoft, and it's still strange for me to say we. <laughs> I was about to say, that's pretty good to do that so quick. What we've done here at Microsoft over the over the past few years has been so extraordinary. And I, uh, what we're unveiling in San Francisco at the Future of SharePoint event today is so amazing that it really is the reason why I felt it was time for me to come on board and join this team in the incredible efforts they've been making. Uh, that's awesome. And I know, so for our listeners, I know you're, you're going to be uh, seeing this, this episode is going to be released on May the 4th on the afternoon, uh, East coast, at least the afternoon of May the 4th. And it's, it's uh, being released a little bit after you have just gone through what we call the big May the 4th event, which is a big SharePoint event in San Francisco. Um, so through the magic of, I guess, time shifting in our cool time machine that we have here at the podcast, we're recording this a day or two early before May the 4th, and we're going to go through and release it. So if you hear a couple of like dates, Dan and I kind of saying yes in two days or whatever, we're referring to May the 4th here. But um, uh, yeah, so I mean, hey, May the 4th, this is a big thing. I mean, I've been in SharePoint now since I started back in September of 2003 when it was SharePoint Portal Server 2003 and lived in it as a dev through every single version going up and now primarily spend most of my time just in the cloud with Office 365, with um, with Azure. But you guys are doing a lot of big announcements on May the 4th and and a lot of stuff around SharePoint here. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to you know bring you on the show. We wanted to talk to you a little bit. Can't think of a better person to, to talk about this and show the energy for it. But what do people, you know, need to, to walk away from? What were the big announcements that you guys that you guys had here in San Francisco? Well, I think the the big announcement really is how incredibly dedicated we are to the future of SharePoint, both in the cloud, on premises, and in your pocket. And we're going to have a huge number of announcements. So I know you and I will spend the rest of the show talking about that. But it really is our commitment to SharePoint as the place where teams can go to discover, share, and collaborate on content, where people can work across devices with a beautiful and simple experience, whether it's in the browser or in one of our mobile apps. And I think people are going to just be thrilled at what we announced today. It is a vision event Although we will be starting to roll out the products of that vision even this month, the rest of the announcements will be executed between now and the end of the year for the most part. And I think the thing that makes me most excited about this event is I personally believe that after people listen to this podcast and after people view the live stream of the event, which will, by the way, be available on demand for viewing at uh, aka.ms slash future of SharePoint, after people really look at what we've announced, I think this is an opportunity for the technology really to sell itself. This is going to be something that people are going to be able to show their boss, show their coworkers, show their IT organization, show their compliance department, and people will literally go, I want that. That's what I need. It's it's going to just simply sell itself. It's it, what, the, what the team has built here is extraordinary. Oh, that's fantastic. So, I mean, it's great to see that stuff is going to be releasing, you know, coming out starting in May here of 2016 and then coming out through the rest of the, uh, through the rest of the year. What kinds of things can people be looking for? I'm sure that there are things that would be falling into different camps and different audiences. You got people from, you know, on the executive side or from the information worker side or from the dev side or from the infrastructure side. I guess if you have a uh, particular uh, one that that is your favorite, but of course, I'm sure you probably wouldn't share, can't really share the favorite stuff and everything, but what would you, I guess, going through in no particular order, let's do it like that. So I'll, I'll save you a little bit from the new job thing. <laughs> <laughs> How would you kick us off here? Like what things should people have a big takeaway for on this? Well, I think one of the things that's going to cause the most stir for sure, and is going to surprise people and blow their socks off is the SharePoint mobile app. The SharePoint mobile app is a way that we're giving people to take their internet and put it in their pocket, literally. Uh, And it's going to give you a beautiful experience browsing your SharePoint-based intranet, whether that intranet is in Office 365 or in on-prem with SharePoint 2016 and SharePoint 2013 even. Uh, And this is something that our customers have been longing for for a very, very long time. We'll have the opportunity for organizations to curate news and announcements to their uh, team, to their organization. It's going to give you, as a user, really seamless access to all of your SharePoint sites. So you might be familiar right now with the current SharePoint sites page uh, in Office 365 or in SharePoint 2016. Uh, That page experience comes onto the phone with the ability to see sites you've visited recently and sites that are surfaced to you intelligently through the power of the Office Graph. 
So you won't have to spend time digging for sites that you that are important to you. But if there's a site that is something you know you need to follow, you'll be able to literally follow that bookmark it, so to speak, and it will be available to you right from the sites tab of the app. And then when you go into one of your team sites, it's going to render beautifully. And this, uh, it, this includes not only our new team site experience that we'll talk about in a few moments, I'm sure, but also mm. your existing team sites and any custom experiences, apps, and pages that you build. So all within one application, one mobile app, you're going to have the ability to get to all your content, collaborate on it, and also to the people you work with. Well, one mm. of the things that we're finding is over time, the people side of collaboration is becoming more and more important, which it should be. It's about people. Mm-hmm. And through the, uh, through the people tab of the app, you're going to be able to get to your coworkers, to people who are working around you that, that you can either search for or find through Office Graph. And from those people, see the content they're working on. So no longer, for example, am I going to have to say, oh my gosh, I know Andrew shared this file with me. What the heck folder was it in? I'm going to be able to go to the people tab of my mobile app, go to you and see that file that you shared with me. Um, It's going to be a much more personal and people driven experience. I need that just for my own stuff to see what I've been working on to be able to find my own stuff, much less who's been sharing stuff with me. (laughs) I I use it exactly that way. And everyone here at Microsoft who's been using the app, it really, truly changes the way we work. It's and and it's in a very good way. Oh, that's fantastic. You mentioned uh, a second ago, new team site experience. That's like, Right off the bat, that was like, you know, light bulbs pop off. Like, wait, wait, wait a minute, what's, what's that? <laughs> uh, this, is, this is really exciting. And one of the things that just almost gives me chills every time I talk about it. So the team side experience in SharePoint has been evolving over the years. Um, but I think everyone would agree that uh, today it doesn't look terribly different than it did in Microsoft Office SharePoint Server 2007. So we knew that there was a huge opportunity to invest in team sites and to make them mobile first, cloud first, and intelligent. And so now when you come to a team site, you're going to have a a beautiful experience when you land that will allow you to uh, see content easily, that again can be curated by your team or can be surfaced through personalized experience driven by Office Graph. Um, And then within the team site itself, everything's getting a beautiful refresh. So the document library experience has been refreshed. In fact, we started rolling that out to first release tenants um, already the last couple of weeks, and we can talk more about that. Uh, Mm -hmm. We're refreshing lists uh, and making them mobile and beautiful inside the uh, mobile app. We're creating a new publishing experience. I know you'll want to talk about that. And the team site, very importantly, is now connected with Office 365 groups in the SharePoint Online service. So that means now every group will have a team site, and we'll get that rich collaboration that a team site provides and the group will continue, will, will now provide the membership construct for team sites so that it makes it very easy for the business to manage access through the Office 365 group construct. You add someone to a group, they get access to their team site, to their calendar, to their plan, to everything else across Office 365 that group powers. Oh, that's great. It's really a spectacular experience. And the cool thing is, this is going to not only affect new team sites, but will also roll out to existing team sites. We'll go into the details of this in one of our deep dive videos, and I'll give you the link for those two as well. But uh, existing team sites, if they haven't been customized too much, will have the ability of just absorbing this new experience without really much effort at all on the part of the organization, and, um, which is fantastic. Oh, that's great. So the, so the integration too with, I mean, you, okay, there's a lot of stuff there we got to pick through, but yeah. um, you mentioned with the linkage of an Office 365 group with a uh, team site now. So that, I mean, I guess thinking back, that's going to replace what I had in say SharePoint 2013, where I would create these like site mailbox type sites, which would, would try and be, they were kind of like team sites, but they were kind of linked to team sites. They were given an email address and stuff, but stuff always was like, I've got to go out and access to this. I've got to access to this. I've got to access to this. And so this way, it sounds like we're really just taking groups and team sites and just kind of, I don't want to say you're merging them together, but you're making it to where they are kind of seen of one construct. So I don't have to worry about trying to go through and figure out, you know, let's go add in access for, to build a calendar list or something like that. It's like, let's put that inside of a group, which I have named of integration with that inside of Outlook on Outlook Windows Desktop to be able to see, you know, stuff straight from the team site really keeps things a lot cleaner and kind of instead of going to so many different sources to find stuff. That's exactly right. So 
you know, when we introduced groups last year, the whole uh, vision was to really make it a membership construct for all of Office 365 that would allow you to define who is on a team, who's on a project, who's in a group, who's in a department. And our vision for those groups over time is to really become a very dynamic definition as well so that you'll have the ability to not just specify who's a member, but, but really drive it dynamically. Hmm. When we rolled out groups, we gave them experiences uh, like a shared, uh, the, the, what is effectively a shared inbox, the conversations, uh, calendar, which is supported by Exchange Online, the notebook, uh, and the files, which actually, as you probably know, are a document library in a, in a hidden site collection currently, or previously, I should say. And those experiences uh, were immediately useful to people. They saw, for example, the conversations would replace the you know, the, the site inbox and would, would be better than a distribution list. They saw all of that, and it led to this debate about should you use a group or should you use a team site? And we tried to tell people, you know, it's really about using both. It's not an or, it's an and. And I think this will really allow people to see exactly what we meant by that. Uh, because now the, the group provides the ability to have a conversation and that Outlook integrated calendar the SharePoint uh, team site provides the collaboration space, the list, the pages, the library. And um, over time, the existing groups and existing team sites that people have already created will come together uh, and be able to be linked and, and, and glommed together. But the cool thing is moving forward, your new team sites, when you provision a team site, you will be provisioning a group. Two things that are super cool about that. First, as you might know, we've infused groups with information classification. Um, so that you can say a group has a certain, uh, works with a certain class of information and therefore policies associated with that information class will be applied to that group. Now, that same information classification will then extend to the SharePoint site, giving you a more centralized definition of, of what security, compliance, and privacy should be associated with that that group and that team site. And can also, you'll be able to do things, I know that Microsoft does this internally with their SharePoint environment, but being able to um, have almost like little flags and showing like what kind of a business impact this thing has. So I can say like high business impact, medium business impact, or just informational kind of stuff. Exactly. And you know, when I was yeah. a consultant and, and when I was doing training and speaking at events, that was one of the things I encouraged organizations to do is, is, not, is, is start keeping track of what sites you've got, what teams are working on those sites, and most importantly, what classes of information those sites are supporting because that then should drive all of the security, compliance, and privacy definitions of, of that site. And so people were doing that manually. They were building tools. And now we're starting to see all of that get incorporated um, directly into uh, SharePoint team sites. Uh, that's big. Okay. So let me ask you this then. So when you, we talk about, you know, I heard you say conversations and I heard you say, you know, we're taking, when you create a team site, you're creating a group at the same time and kind of putting them all together. Where does the conversation story with like, say Yammer kind of come into play? Because I know a lot of organizations had a lot of investments there and I'm still a little confused on when I go, uh, Yammer and groups. I know which one I prefer, but I, you know, which, I'm, I'm a little confused when I try and explain it to somebody. Like, instead of just saying here are two different, here are two options, not really knowing which way to direct them. How would you kind of frame that discussion here? Well, you know, I've never heard that question before. Group. <laughs> <laughs> that that's such such a novel question, Andrew. <laughs> of course. <laughs> That's the sixty-four thousand dollar question we hear it all the time. And the reality is, you, there really are, and there continue to be. Uh, several options for conversation. So uh, Yammer is still, you know, very much supported. People have seen we've been investing heavily in it, so it's not going anywhere. And Yammer will be able to incorporate, integrate into SharePoint team sites, and the group's definition is is getting incorporated by Yammer as well. So all of that's, you know, still there. Uh, and then on the other side, there's the group conversation, which is really an Exchange inbox based based um, service. And I think it really depends. A team is going to have to decide what requirements it has for conversation. I certainly see Yammer is wonderful for supporting sort of the water cooler conversations that are constantly ongoing and, and sort of, they don't have a long lifespan. It's really just sort of us chatting, but through an app. Whereas I think group conversations are better suited for things that are going to go over a long period of time that maybe you want um, the ability to drop a new team member in a team and give them easy insight to what's happened so far. That's possible with groups. When someone joins a group, they can see all the past conversations very easily. And very importantly, there are certain underlying capabilities like e-discovery that are native to exchange. So there are definitely those two 
paths for conversation and they're both still fully supported and we're investing in both. I got you. Okay. Um, an- another question then, so to kind of drilling back into some of the stuff we talked about here with new team sites, you referred to uh, like a refresh with document libraries. Uh, is this what people have, the people have seen, we, I, I know we've talked about it a little bit on the show, but is this what people have seen with like essentially making document libraries feel and look a lot more like OneDrive? Yes, we obviously get a lot of telemetry, or as we like to say, a lot of inbound data about how people use our user interfaces. And we found that with the improvements we made to OneDrive on the consumer side, and we brought those into OneDrive for Business, there's a lot more usage. Uh, people are, are finding what they need more easily for uploading and renaming and downloading and sharing documents. And so we've brought that learning into the document library experience where now the modern document library experience includes a quick action bar at the top. The ribbon is not there by default, but you have the buttons you need most regularly. And then you've got the three dots, just like in OneDrive for Business, that drop down all of your other commands, including your custom actions. And the goal then is to you know, really unify the experience. So what you've learned in OneDrive applies to your document libraries. Now, of course, mm-hmm. behind the scenes, document libraries are, you know, have significant power beyond what OneDrive consumer and even OneDrive for business offer. Uh, we've got content types, we've got metadata, we've got workflows, we've got customizability um, and process. Uh, and all those things still exist in the document library. And we're just making them easier to, you know, easier to get to. So you're not having to dig through a ribbon to get to those things. Mm-hmm. And one of the key user interface constructs that helps with that is the information panel. So very much like it in OneDrive or OneDrive for Business, when you, when you select a file, you can click the eye in the upper right corner. It gives you an information panel on the right that gives you super easy access to your metadata. So you can fill in all your metadata without having to you know, pop up an extra window. And uh, my personal opinion is it, it really is a great new interface. I, I really like it. The people who've worked with it have really liked it. So we're, we're excited to continue rolling that out through first release and then to the general public. Awesome. Oh, by the way, one of the things I love, here's one of the things I love most about it. So when I was working for IT Unity, we had, you know, we wanted to have an image library um, where we had logos and, and images and all that stuff. And we wanted to make it something that people who were in our marketing department could actually keep synchronized on their computer. And we had this challenge of, you know, OneDrive or sorry, SharePoint document libraries can synchronize but they don't have really the thumbnail view in the classic SharePoint document library. And so we tried the photo library and we tried the, the media, the asset library, and those couldn't sync. And now with this new experience, you've got a gorgeous, rich thumbnail view. You've got um, access to information about the, the document and what's happening to it. And so you, you, you know, it's the best of both worlds. You can sort and group now with your metadata columns, so you don't have to necessarily shell into the create view interface to group things. And you can even pin documents to the top. So if there's if there are documents that you think are really important to the library, you can pin them to the top so they're just there and you don't have to go scrolling through your library to find them. Great improvements. I'm looking forward to spending a little bit more time with that to be able to see like what the benefit is, the firsthand benefit. You also mentioned something about a new publishing experience or a refreshed publishing experience here. Can you, can you talk a little bit more about that? That's something that's been, oh my goodness, back from... Uh, that's how I really got into SharePoint. So back when I got out of college, uh, I went to go work for a uh, little web development startup shop uh, where we did a bespoke content management system. Uh-huh. I, I, we called it Adminet. And it was, uh, at the time, I didn't realize what I was doing. Sorry, let me say that differently because that didn't sound <laughs> you right. You never know what you're going um, to do. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> at the time, I didn't realize that what I was doing actually is a thing now. So I was building single page apps using Ajax, but I was like writing to an iframe and doing post back and parsing out stuff that came back, but we didn't have all these beautiful libraries we have today. And it managed the content on a site. And then I went in to go went for another company. We started using Content Management Server. Then we merged CMS and SharePoint together. And then that's how I got into SharePoint. And then the whole WCM thing is kind of a, was a sweet spot of mine for a long time uh, for SharePoint. So you say publishing refresh. That kind of popped my ears up a little bit here. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, we've got a gorgeous, gorgeous new page publishing model now that uh, you will just love. We gave a hint of it when we rolled out the new authoring experience in the Delve People blog, uh, where if you've used that, you know that it's super easy to create a really nice blog post and add images and, and to, to just with just a few clicks, you know, add content and, and make it just gorgeous. We've extended that into the new publishing model for SharePoint team sites, 
where you're going to be able to create gorgeous pages just as easily as you would on some of those really popular third party create a website kinds of uh, applications. But you're going to and you're going to be able to use custom web parts. Uh, we will talk. We can talk more about that in a moment for sure. And it's all mobile by default. So when you create a page, it's going to be responsive. It's going to look beautiful in the SharePoint mobile app. And you can share it across your organization very easily as well. All right. So this is the point when the recording for Dan's uh, track actually got we had an issue with it and we lost Dan. So it really, really is disappointing because we missed some some really good conversation with Dan. Um, as a call to action to just to kind of let everybody know one of the things we did do at the very end of the interview, um, you can find Dan, follow Dan on Twitter. That's at Dan home, or you can also follow him on Facebook, which is facebook.com slash home Dan. Yes, that's backwards. Found that kind of interesting, but that's his, uh, his SharePoint page for himself on Facebook. One of the things, and then again, you can also find out everything about the event at aka.ms slash future of SharePoint. He did talk about a couple other things that I did want to highlight. Um, CJ and I did talk about before we started, I played the interview for you about the SharePoint framework. One of the things that they talked about, that Dan talked about with that is that not only is that going to start shipping in summer of 2016, but one of the things that it's going to also include is something that's going to address a pain point that a lot of SharePoint developers have had for many, many years. I guess we've well, really, since the beginning of time. And that is the ability to build stuff locally on your own machine. So it's going to have something called the Workbench, which is supposed to make it to where you don't have to have a SharePoint install in order to build one of these things. Yeah, I don't know a lot about it, but uh, Dan mentioned it was the first I had heard about it. And so it'll be interesting to, to learn more about this, hopefully from a lot of the recordings that they're releasing. Another thing, too, that he talked about that I thought was really interesting uh, about some of the changes that were happening, especially around the, the team sites, was around this concept that um, not only do we, we talk a little bit already about how every group, every team site gets a group and vice versa. So permissioning and, assign, and uh, granting access to groups is a lot easier. But the other thing that I thought was interesting was this concept of like dynamic groups or dynamic permissions. And the idea is, is that you would get certain permissions based on the device and the location where you were. So like, say, for example, you would be allowed to download things if you were like on your laptop on the Microsoft uh, corporate network. But if you were off the corporate network, you would not be allowed to download a document. You'd just be able to read it. Gotcha. He said that there's additional permissions and different rights that they're looking to go through and add to that as well. So Yeah, that's kind of interesting because data leakage is a big deal for some companies. So Yeah. So again, th this whole thing, this whole event that we did that Dan and I uh, talked about in our interview was really all focused around the future of SharePoint. Some things you'll start to see uh, getting rolled out in May of 2016. The rest of the stuff you'll see start getting rolled out throughout the summer, later on into the fall. And I'm sure we're going to see a lot more stuff uh, at the Ignite conference in Atlanta later on in September of this year. Yeah. So, CJ, what's your what's your take on this whole thing? Like, do you what's your kind of big walk away from the future of SharePoint event that we had today? Overall, I'm quite pleased with it, to be honest. Like, I think putting a stake in the ground and saying, here's what we're working on is a great thing, right? rather than sort of trickle feeding out things as they come out, I think doing this event in lieu of something like a SharePoint conference or another big event is, is a really nice rallying point for the community and for customers around SharePoint again. And so from that perspective, I'm really positive about it. From the individual announcements, probably the most the, the thing I'm the most excited about is refreshing the end user experience around team sites. I think that um, one of the biggest struggles uh, a lot of customers have is getting people using the tools and training them up on how to do it. And I think a lot of that is just that the end user experience, on especially around their web experiences, has fallen way behind and uh, was just too complicated in the past. And so I think I think that's a really that'll be a really positive thing for um, for SharePoint with end users uh, because they all whine about how hard it is to use, right? And and it's fair. It just hasn't kept the pace. So I think that's really exciting. I'm hedging on the dev stuff for now. I, I need to learn more about it. So, I mean, I know the basics and I know the kind of direction it's going and I've worked with that team while they were cooking it all up, obviously. But um, as the bits come out, I've got to play with them. So um, to me, it feels too much in the enterprise customer focus bucket for me to be excited about it being an ISV. Yeah, that's fair. I think I agree with you on all the stuff about SharePoint. I, I have been from SharePoint in and of itself. I do... I. 
it's a good thing that they're putting this kind of an event out, not waiting for a big conference. I like how the Azure team has the Azure Con where they go through and they release a bunch of their own stuff that they're working on. And they have all the recorded videos. I really like this new format that Microsoft is using where you have a, a very presentation style event that is streamed live that you can go see. And then there's also deep dive videos that you can go see uh, more information about it. I like that because really, I mean, from personally, I know I'm, I'm considering going to the Ignite conference later this fall, but I've already decided that I'm not going to buy a, a, a registration for sessions unless I get picked to speak. And then of course I'll, I get one of those, but which will be nice because then you can go see the sessions. But to me, it just doesn't, I don't see the value in actually going to watch the sessions at a conference. I'd rather be interacting with people and working in the expo. So this format, at least it works great for me. Yeah. Um, and plus all the, all the content's already recorded and stuff, so you can go watch it later. But right. the SharePoint piece, I mean, it's nice to see them stick the stake in the ground. I, I know I'm probably in the minority on this, but to me, a lot of the stuff that I've seen with SharePoint, not only from this event, but also from really from SharePoint over the last Gosh, it's almost, I'd say, I almost said 10 years, but and it might be going too far, but maybe not. It still feels like it's a lot of body work, that there's not a lot of stuff that's happening to the chassis. Like, I think that there's a lot of stuff with, with SharePoint, the engine itself, really needs to get like the, it feels like it needs to get a real big overhaul in terms of how data access works, how the structure works, and stuff like that. A lot of these things, like the, the change in document libraries, the change in lists, the, those kinds of things... From the developer side of me, it still feels like when I make calls to like the REST APIs, things are a little are slower than they really should be. And when I want to do any kind of load and then throttling becomes an issue and stuff, um, kind of dovetailing over to your point that you talked about with the SharePoint uh, framework. I'm not going to say, I don't, I don't think it's fair for me or really any, any of us to say that, you know, yes, you like it. No, you don't like it because we haven't seen it and it's early. I am curious to see how they handle the question of no matter how they want to spin it, we're still going to see the question come up of we have yet another SharePoint development model. And I would like to ask the really hard question of why should I care about this development model when you told me in 2007 to do farm solutions. You told me three years later in 2010 that I needed to do sandbox solutions. You told me in 2013, three years later, to do apps and add-ins. And then now you're telling me in 2016 to do this new framework model. But all along, you're saying, don't get rid of any of that other stuff. I kind of am looking at it and saying, so when is it that you're going to show us that you're going to stick with one of these models and evolve it and not drop it and come up with something brand new and start over? And it's starting, I mean, it's, I had a blog post out, you know, I know we talked about it on the show many months ago about, you know, you treat SharePoint like a, like a service, don't treat it like a platform. And I know that they don't like that. I know they didn't like that. I said that, and I know that they don't like the, this new model is supposed to treat it more like a platform, but I'm so far, I'm, I'm still kind of yet to see, until I see the underpinnings of, of it being a really good place to do that kind of stuff, I, I don't know if I really want to have, if I want to give SharePoint or Office 365 my code to go host it. I'd rather go host it in Azure and, and have it connect in and talk to it from a third party using services and OAuth. And, and OAuth so. Yeah, I'm definitely on that boat. I was very critical of that team while I was at Microsoft. And it was partially for this reason, which was, hey, look, if this doesn't become You've got the right intentions. You want to make it easier to go build stuff. I get that. But if you don't ensure that this is a iteration on the add-in model and giving the add-in model more capabilities to go do more things, then we're going to get this backlash from developers. And so things like, for example, it could have been things like packaging and distribution. Uh, you could package these things up and distribute them the same way you do with add-ins would go a really long way to making it not a completely different thing and ensuring that developers saw it as uh, iteration on the capabilities available in the add-in model, not a brand new model. And I think that's really important for this reason, right? Because otherwise people are going to balk at the idea of yet another development model and it's going to be a whole new thing. And, and Microsoft need to give them a step into this approach and to upgrade and bring new capabilities to the way they're currently building stuff, not reinvent the wheel. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how people um, accept this over the next, over the summer. So it'll be cool to see how things uh, how things go. But hey, big event, big good event. And um, I guess from there we will uh, see where we go. 
Anyway, just go and wrap up the show then. So thank you very much, everybody, for listening to this. Make sure you go to aka.ms, a future of SharePoint. Go check out some of the recordings from the day. And from that, we will see you next week for another show. Thanks a lot. Rock and roll. See ya. If you have a question for us, go to microsoftcloudshow.com slash questions, where you can submit it as text or record it as a WAV or an MP3 file and provide a link so that we can play your question on the show. Our theme music is an excerpt from Evaporated Eric by Monk Turner used under Creative Commons. You can subscribe to us on iTunes by searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or via RSS at microsoftcloudshow.com, where you'll also find show notes of each episode. You can find us on Facebook searching for the Microsoft Cloud Show or on Twitter at MS Cloud Show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. <laughs>